And the question for this week is, does consent always have to be vocalised? Welcome back to Sitting in a Car. I'm Sarah Sproul and I sit in a car with you every week answering a question to help you raise your confident and caring young person who respects themselves and the people around them. So does consent have to be vocalized? Such a good question, right? Because when we vocalize consent, it makes it much simpler. Um, It makes it much simpler to be able to listen to the words someone is saying rather than having to interpret uh, body language or sort of other signs that we may be trying to read to work out what they want. That is really difficult for an adult, let alone a young person trying to negotiate their world of intimacy and relationships, right? So let's get into this question. First thing to say is that, of course, consent is communication. And communication is super important for all sorts of things in life, not just to do with negotiating um, sexual experiences or physical intimacy or that sort of thing. So while we will be talking about consent, sometimes we get hung up a little bit on the idea of sexual consent and we forget that there are lots of different ways to practice the skills of negotiating consent in everyday life. So I tell a story about one of my children who um, doesn't need to wear coats. I don't know where they got that from, but even in the cold Irish winter, they don't seem to need to wear coats like I need to wear coats. I would generally need to wear two coats. So we often will have this interaction where they will be getting ready to go to school and they're about to go out the front door and I say, you haven't got a coat on? And they say, I don't need a coat. And I say, yes, you do. And they say, no, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. And what was happening there is, now I realize now that I'm thinking about consent, is their body needed a particular thing to feel comfortable. And they were communicating to me that their body needed this particular thing. But because my body didn't need that, my body needed the opposite thing, i.e. lots of coats, I didn't believe that what they were saying was the right thing. And I was trying to push my way of doing something onto them. It took weeks, really, for me to realize that this person really didn't need a coat and me pushing it on them was not respectful of their particular needs. That is a form of consent. Well, a form of non-consent, actually, because I was trying to push them to do something that they didn't need or want to do. And so you will notice that there will be experiences like that in your family life. Um, Do children want to eat a particular thing? Are they hungry? Are they not hungry? Now, most parents will say this is a minefield for them when they start realizing that negotiating consent is everywhere in our family life. And sometimes they'll say to me, but how am I ever going to get things done? And yes, that is difficult. It's a whole sort of mind shift for us as parents, particularly if we were raised with um, parents who what they said went and we weren't allowed to question that and if we were questioning that that was disrespectful or that's what our parents told us so this is hard I'll, I'll just give you this this is hard the thing about communicating consent or what we need or what are listening to what other people need is that it's a skill that happens over time so if you have been working on this skill for a while in terms of communicating what your needs are to the people around you then you may be getting a little bit impatient with your younger people if they don't have the same level of ability but again it's something that takes time and oftentimes young people Um, We sometimes expect them, if they're starting to learn about their body and starting to share their body with someone else, maybe if that's just kissing or dancing, not necessarily sex at all, we can be wanting them to be like communication consent ninjas. And that's just not necessarily the way it always works. We can give our young people lots of information about consent, but when they get out into the field and they're actually trying to do this sometimes they can muck it up and sometimes they realize maybe they're not as good at it as they thought maybe they're not able to say exactly what they want to say or maybe they're not really fully able to listen to someone else's communication that is quite nuanced or subtle that's just something to be aware of and we can talk to young people about how complicated it can be in real life and in fact we should be talking about that because if we just say that you know, consent is yes means yes and no means no and I don't know means I don't know, then we are limiting um, their understandings that life can be complicated and sometimes there is not a, um, a simple answer for things. So 
what are some of the teachable moments that you can use around the house? You will probably have already heard the tickling one. So if you're playing the tickling game and your child says stop, you straight away stop and then you can make it obvious. You say, I heard you say stop, so I've stopped. And then you can talk about that later with them and say, what was that like um, saying stop and someone stopping straight away? What did that feel like? And they will probably tell you that was they were glad and then you can maybe ask them well what would it felt like if I hadn't stopped and they probably will say well that wouldn't have felt very good and and then you can hammer home the point and say yeah so it's really important when you're um, doing something with someone else something fun a game or something that you really need to listen when people are saying stop and certainly as an adult if children are playing around you and you hear someone saying no no and nobody's listening you can yell out some nobody's listening you need to listen to someone say no or need to listen to someone say yes or whatever it is um, you can also use your own consent as a teaching moment for your children so there is often times when I will say the children are asking me to do something like um, uh, can you take us down to the shops so we can buy chewing gum and I'll say it doesn't suit me right now I'm in the, the middle of work and then my children will often say, oh, please, you do. Of course you want to go. Come on, you don't need to work right now. You can. And they will try and convince me. And so it's really useful to notice when children are trying to convince us that maybe our first answer wasn't the answer that they want. And therefore, they're trying to change our mind about it. And one of the simple things you can say is, I just need to make sure you understand. Are you telling me that you know what I need to do better than I need to know what I want to do? And oftentimes then they'll say, no, but I really want to go. And you can say, yeah, I know you really want to go, but I can't do that right now. And stay firm. No, I can't do that right now. So when children are trying to convince you um, that maybe the first answer you gave wasn't the right answer, that is a really good opportunity to show them what is happening there. And that maybe that isn't such a great way to treat other people when they've given them an answer that they don't like. So the take home message about consent, it is not always going to be communicated with words, though it may be the easiest way to tell people what we want and listen to what other people want. At the same time, there is going to be body language and other sorts of cues that children and young people and even adults need to cue into. And so this is something that we can work on every single day of our lives within our family. And that's sitting in a car for another week where I've answered a question to help you raise your confident and caring young person who respects themselves and the people around them. Bye for now.